Hi, I'm Sarah Calgill, along with Andrew Moran, Dave Patterson, Graham Noble, and John Klar. And this is The Conservative Five, an online TV news production of Liberty Nation News. Since Israel stepped off its attacks on Hezbollah last week and over the weekend, talk of all-out war is buzzing. With the increase in frequency and intensity of cross-border exchanges, many fear the stage is set for a full-scale war in southern Lebanon. Israel is urging residents of southern Lebanon to get out of their homes and leave areas where Hezbollah has stole ammunition, rockets, and missiles. The Biden administration, however, is not decisive and continues to ride the fence. Dave, is there a diplomatic way to resolve this or have they gone too far? Simple answer is no. You know, negotiating an end uh, to violence with terrorists whose only tool to achieve its aims is violence. Uh, that's a fool's errand. And the United States has, has engaged in that far too long. Anthony Blinken's too numerous to count trips to the Middle East to try to bring, you know, some sort of negotiated peace. You know, they have been for, well, want of a better term, total failures. There is no peace there because he's not dealing with people who actually want peace. Israel, on the other hand, is dealing with the problem of Hezbollah and Hamas in a way that the terrorist organizations actually understand. In other words, if you endanger the lives and property of Israeli citizens, we will kill you. And, and that, that, that's pretty impressive, actually, when you're the one being killed. You know, listening to the U.S. press, you get the idea that Hezbollah just got it into their heads to attack Israel with what is approaching 9,000 rockets since October 7th. Hezbollah has been attacking Israel routinely for decades. And the U.S. should be grateful for the elimination of Ibrahim Akil and Fuad Sheikh Shukr. Uh, that's been, they've been sought by the U.S. for their roles in the truck bombings and the destruction of the U.S. Embassy in Beirut that killed 63 people and the U.S. Marine Barracks in 1983 that killed over 240 Marines. You know, there was a $7 million reward for Akil, uh that was put out by the United States. Let's face it, the Israelis did it for free. We should applaud that. Well, Graham, what, what is stopping Israel from just obliterating Hezbollah, just till it's nothing but a parking lot? I am hesitant to say that the Israelis actually could do that at all. It would take a massive effort on the part of Israel, and it wouldn't be anywhere near as relatively easy as it's been for them to um, you know, move into the Gaza Strip and to take on Hamas. Uh, there's, uh, there's a huge difference between Hezbollah and Hamas. Hezbollah, for a start, practically runs southern Lebanon. Um, they have thousands of fighters. They have stockpiles of uh, ammunition and other ordinances. Uh, they have, uh, I was going to say they have great communications networks, but maybe now uh, not so much. Um, <laughs> Uh, but, you know, I, I mean, as, as far as, OK, you know, they're a terrorist organization. There's no doubt about it. There's no point pretending they're anything else. But they are also they're almost also kind of on a par with a modern national army. I mean, they, they really are uh, very well organized. I, I mean, could Israel absolutely wipe them out? I think it would take uh, enormous, uh, enormous effort, uh, enormous amount of casualties on both sides and uh, enormous destruction done to uh, the southern part of Lebanon. You know, it's not so much a question of could Israel do it. It's it's would they want to, and and would they think it was a an expedient way of of moving forward? But I, you know, I just don't. You know, if you just weaken them and you don't cut the head off the snake, what's the point? Because well, they can. I mean, they can continue to target back. the top. The top Hezbollah commanders, they're going to continue to target them. So so it's kind of what they're doing is they're continuously cutting the head off the snake. Uh, but then, you know, this this particular snake is regenerating. It's, you know, it's growing a new head mm -hmm. back, you know, and then and then they'll take them out. But the real head of the snake, let's face it, it's not Hezbollah. It's not Hamas. It's not Islamic Jihad. The head of the snake is in Tehran. Right. 
Clark, um, is all of this Middle East unrest with where we're, you know, I mean, we're close to an all out, holy moly war on our hands and on her watch. Is this going to affect the election day or is it just one thing that Americans aren't focusing on? Well, I, I think as these uh, two more knowledgeable than I gentlemen have explained, this is this is a very complex issue with a long history. And I think if we look at the polls, we will see that public support for Israel has long been strong, but was declining before the current administration. But there are some, you know, not everybody remembers the history that we're, you know, part of which we're talking about here today. They don't even remember Beirut, um, you know, let alone the Six Day War and et cetera. Um, but I think it's very interesting to listen to Graham and Dave speak because a lot of what they're talking about with regard to Israel's. Uh, uh, you know, uh, horn locking with Hamas right now is linked to this election because it has really a two faced war. One is conventional, which we're talking about. The other is winning the hearts and minds. And for instance, as long as Hamas retains those hostages, public sentiment is pretty strongly behind Israel. The moment Hamas gave up those hostages, world public sentiment uh, might tip even more against Israel. That would suggest that maybe Kamala Harris should be trying to work a deal to get the hostages out. But there's inaction. There's a paralysis by this administration. They're afraid of stirring up their um, very hostile, genocidal uh, pro-Palestinian base. Um, the, the majority of Americans are looking for some kind of action. It seems like Israel and the world are waiting for the outcome of the election, outcome of this election. Either Donald Trump will step to the fore and Israel will have its both conventional um, and ideological ally back at its side, or Kamala Harris will come forward and then we'll find out what was voted for. Uh, because it's not clear. She says she supports Israel, uh, but uh, it's Israel, it's right to defend itself. But without Israel, without America by its side, um, Israel is is uh, being cut off at the knees, it seems to me. So the, the, the two are very, very inextricably woven in this election. And I'm reminded of the hostages in Iran and Carter and Reagan. John, I, I think, too, there, there are two things that that play into this whole uh, complex issue. Uh, one is uh, Vice President Harris's uh, insistence that a, uh, a conclusion to this must uh, end in a two-state solution. That's absurd. The, the two states are Israel and, and that's right, nobody knows. So a two-state <laughs> solution is ridiculous. Yeah. And the other side of this is that the single stumbling block to a ceasefire in Hamas land in Gaza is Hamas. And what they want is the opportunity to restructure Hamas, to reconstitute Hamas. And that isn't going to happen as long as Israel has something to say about it. And they do. Well, Andrew, let's go back to that worldview that uh, Mr. Clark was explaining. Um, you know, you weren't alive yet, but some of us remember when Reagan won in 1980, all of a sudden there were hostages released uh, from Iran. And that was something that showed the American people that there was strength there and it showed the world there was strength there. So is the world waiting for us to do something or are they just waiting and, you know, clutching their pearls, Andrew? Okay, so I'll, I'll touch that in a moment. I just want to touch, touch upon two other things quickly. Uh, Graham, he talked about Iran. I think it's worth pointing out that Iran recently sent the first fuel ship in Beirut uh, since this, since this uh, conflict metastasized. Also, what Dave is talking about, I think when it comes to two-state solution, the Palestinians, they don't want a two-state solution because that means they would have to govern themselves and they would have to govern the whole mess and the whole situation and then no longer will they, will be, will they be uh, depicted as victims and they'll, ha they'll get less donations and less financing from the international community. So I think th that there will never be a two-state solution because they don't want it. Now as to your question, 
and the, the world is waiting for the U.S. to do something. I don't think any politician is in the United States is willing to do this, especially ahead of an election. The last thing people want is another major military conflict. The whole point of this whole America first and MAGA and Trump presidencies is to you know, reduce the amount of, of America's footprint in these global conflicts. You know, the polls show people don't want war. People don't want to extend, expand conflicts, you know. There's even polls showing people are, 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 aren't as uh, gung-ho about you know, foreign aid and giving all this money to, the, to these other countries. It's a huge base of the Trump Republicans who just want non-intervention and you know, not giving money to America's allies or its enemies until you, know, you start focusing on domestic issues. So the, the world can wait as long as it wants, but I don't think that the U.S., you know, at least you hope that, that they're not going to uh, start putting troops on the ground or start you know, bombing these Tom, bombing Hezbollah or bombing uh, Hamas bombing uh lebanon bombing iran because that, that's a good chance then you're going to lead to a, you're going to get a, a larger war who the heck wants that in today's world when people can hardly put groceries on the table keep the lights on and send their kids to a good school but this is an intractable problem this could be argued the other way around that they want leadership to stop this conflict before it broadens into another opec i mean i think that that cuts both ways because what we see, all I'm really saying, because, by the way, I don't know that any party or politician right now can persuade Hamas, for instance, to release its hostages or maybe do much else. But what we see, I repeat, is a paralysis, a do nothing by this administration. Mm -hmm. And we know that Donald Trump, one way or the other, I think, would would take a strong stance. And I think the world knows that. So whether or not it's America's duty um, to resolve it. I think a flip side of what you're saying too, Andrew, about the two-state solution of the Palestinians is not only do they, do they maybe not want to build a, a country rather than use all money for more bombs, um, you know, as far as Hamas goes, but they don't want to acknowledge the right of Israel to exist. That's why, I mean, that's a big stumbling block. Maybe she should be pushing for that as well. And to link a two-state solution, which the world has spent 60 or 80 years failing to accomplish to the release of the hostages or the resolution of the conflict there only promises a greater conflagration in future. So once again, I just suggest that, you know, maybe it's unavoidable that the U.S. has some toe in those horrible waters and doing nothing is 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 the absolute worst thing if we want to prevent an escalation. I, I just think some people might see it that way. I think a key part of your answer, you said 80 years. This conflict is going on for 80 years. I'm sure longer than that, if you want to go if you go by biblical standards and other other you know world history in that region. And the US has been active there in that region for this entire time, and nothing has been resolved, and it never will be resolved, and no politician is gonna put forth a solution. Even if you have a two-state solution, that's still not gonna end the 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 misery and the suffering and the and, and, and the conflict that occur, that occurs in the region. Now, perhaps I'm wrong. Dave is privy to this to the intelligence of what goes on in the region. You know, he's he's leading these coups. So I don't know, maybe maybe I'm wrong, but I just don't see how it's ever gonna be resolved whether the US is is involved or not. You better you might as well you're better off that. Then just focusing on your challenges at home and you know restoring stronger purchasing power for the American people as opposed to engaging in foreign adventurism. I think it's important to, to remember that prior to Biden, we did have the Abram Accord, which was a major step in bringing Arab nations and Israel together with common cause. That hasn't happened very often in the history of Israel and its neighbors. And I think that's an important aspect because it shows you that if you get rid of the troublemakers, there is an opportunity to do something substantive in the Middle East, and it hadn't been done before. Israel may not reduce the pressure on the terrorist group um, until it's no longer a threat. And if, and if that happens between now and the election, something on November 6th, the day after the election, is bound to pop up. Thanks, panel. That's it for our Conservative 5 panel today. Check out our other C5 shows and segments on your favorite video platform. YouTube, Vimeo, Rumble, we're on them all. As well, Liberty Nation News has its own Roku channel where you can see all of our TV productions. Now, Liberty Nation does not endorse candidates, campaigns, or legislation. And this presentation is no endorsement. I'm your host, Sarah Cowgill. Thanks for joining us today for free thinking, free speech, libertynation.com.